Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to be talking about cauda equina syndrome. We're going to start off by talking about what it is, and then we'll get into the risk factors and the signs and symptoms. So cauda equina syndrome is really just impingement on these nerves of the cauda equina below the conus medullaris. Let's look over here at this anatomy. So right here at the top, we have the spinal cord. This is really the lower thoracic upper lumbar region of the spinal cord. And you'll notice here that as it goes down, it actually terminates, right? The spinal cord doesn't go all the way down through the lumbar spine into the sacrum, right? It has a definite end point called the conus medullaris that exists really between L1 and L2. And then coming down from the conus medullaris, we have all these nerve roots. You can see them looking like little strings here. And so collectively, all of these kind of look like the hairs that make up a horse's tail, thus the term cauda equina, which means horse's tail in Latin. Now the nerve root values that constitute the cauda equina really begin at L2 and go all the way down. So we start at L2, so that means lumbar levels, L2 to L5 all of the sacral nerve root levels, S1 to S5, and then the coccygeal nerve root, which is C0. So cauda equina syndrome is impingement on the cauda equina, any one of these nerve roots at any level of the spine. Okay, And we need to think about pathologies or structures that could cause this compression. Right? Here's one example. So here is a disc. You can see right here, we actually have the cauda equina, those little dots right there. We're actually looking at a cross section. So each one of these is a nerve root that's going down, traveling down towards the coccyx, right? right? And right here we have a herniated disc and it's going posteriorly and a little bit laterally. And yes, it's directly uh, impinging on um, a spinal nerve root right here. It's actually corresponding to S1. However, it can also compress uh, the cauda equina itself. And you're more likely to get this compression if it's a directly posterior herniation. This one's a little off to the side, but if it's more posterior, you can get that compression. We could also consider a ligamentum flavum hypertrophy and ossification. You could also consider detachment of the posterior longitudinal ligament. Basically, anything that could narrow the vertebral canal has the potential to compress the cauda equina, and then you can end up with cauda equina syndrome. So the risk factors are going to be things here that can narrow the vertebral canal and potentially compress the cauda equina. The first one is just simply a low back injury, and generally low back injuries are due to poor lifting mechanics or lifting something too heavy that you were not ready to lift. Okay? Uh, central disc herniation. This one's a little bit off to the lateral side, but if it's directly centrally going posteriorly, that's going to have the most impact on the cauda equina because it's going directly into that vertebral canal. Also, central spinal stenosis. Um, this can result from just simply a degenerative disc. So remember, discs can dehydrate with age. Um, they have other degenerative processes where they thin, and then you have the vertebrae coming closer together. That's called spondylosis. It's basically just an age-related change. Uh, you can also have degenerative facet joints. So not only can the disc degenerate, but the facet joints can. Again, that brings the vertebrae closer together, which actually does uh, in some ways compress the vertebral canal. And then you could also have degenerative spondylolisthesis. So spondylolisthesis is when you're looking at two vertebrae and the one on top, the superior one, translates anteriorly relative to the vertebra below. The most common site of this is L5 and S1. So normally what would happen is L5 would start to translate anteriorly, excessively, relative to S1. And at the interval between L5 and S1, you would have narrowing of that vertebral canal, potential compression on the cauda equina. Also, spinal fractures. If you have any part of the bone that breaks loose, uh, any inflammation, that takes up space, that can hurt the cauda equina. And then you can have ankylosing spondylitis. This is a risk factor because you get excessive bone growth uh, around the vertebrae, and this actually causes the bones to fuse, the vertebrae fuse together, and because there's excessive bone growth, which can occur within the vertebral canal, that also takes up space, therefore leads to more compression on the cauda equina. Here's another view. This is actually a sagittal MRI. You can see down here's the lower lumbar spine. This is L5, 4, 3, 2, 1, a little bit of the lower thoracic, 
And then here's S1. This is actually the sacrum down here. And then right here is this disc. This is between L5 and S1. And you can actually see here, because of this black right here, that the disc there has protruded posteriorly. And uh, the white here is not the cauda equina. It's not the spinal cord. This is actually just fluid. But you can clearly see a gap in that fluid. And then if we look here, right there's the conus medullaris. Uh, between L1 and L2, right, it terminates. And then down here for the remainder of this gray tissue is the cauda equina. And you see here this disc is protruding into that cauda equina. And we're probably going to expect to see impairments related to the sacral nerve root levels and the coccygeal because this compression is occurring between L5 and S1, and it's really the S1 nerve root that's going to exit kind of at this level, so probably S1 and down is where we're going to see the impairments. So that's another thing. With the cauda equina syndrome, it depends on where the impingement is. If the impingement's way up here, then yeah, you're going to see impairments with L2 and down. But in this case, this example, we're not going to see impairments with L2, L3, L4, probably not L5, because the impingement's occurring below that. And one of the best ways to conceptualize cauda equina syndrome is it's very similar to a myelopathy. We talked about myelopathies in another video. That's just a compression on the spinal cord, but it's the same kind of thing, except now instead of the spinal cord proper, it's the cauda equina. Now let's take a look at the signs and symptoms of cauda equina syndrome. The first one here is severe low back pain. This is the only one of these signs and symptoms that does not have to do directly with the nerves that are being compressed. Okay, the low back pain most likely here is simply due to whatever the injury was that is causing the cauda equina. So if somebody was doing deadlifts with really bad form and they decided to go up by 200 pounds and they really injured their back, okay, the back pain itself is most likely just due to that injury. So it could be due to a herniated disc, it could be due to the spondylolisthesis itself, it could be due to a fracture. This doesn't really have as much to do with compression on the cauda equina. This is the actual uh, primary injury. All of these other signs and symptoms are gonna have to do with compression on the nerve roots. Okay, so motor weakness. Not only are we going to expect the motor weakness to be bilateral, but we're also going to expect it to follow a myotomal pattern. So for example, right here we're compressing the cauda equina below L5, so we're probably going to see impairments in all of the sacral nerve root levels and the coccygeal nerve. So for example, the gastrocnemius, your calf muscles, are largely innervated by sacral nerve root levels. In fact, your Achilles reflex is S1 and S2, right? So we might expect to see impairments in plantar flexion bilaterally. However, are we gonna expect to see quadricep weakness in this example? No, because the quadriceps are innervated by the femoral nerve, and that is L2 through L4. This is below those levels, so we wouldn't see motor weakness at L2 through L4. The person will probably also have sensory loss or radicular pain bilaterally. Notice that all of these are bilateral. Remember that radicular pain, this is more your sharp, shooting, burning pain that you have with nerve root damage. The person may also have saddle anesthesia. Now, saddle anesthesia specifically refers to the parts of the skin that would hypothetically be in contact with the saddle here. Okay? But there's other parts of the body in that same area that also become numb, and those are actually those corresponding to the sexual organs. This is actually the female diagram we used in a separate video. Uh, down here we have the posterior labial nerves, which innervate the labia majora and minora. Over here you have the dorsal nerve of the clitoris, which obviously provides sensory innervation uh, from the clitoris. And of course you have male homologs. But the whole point here is that these are also largely uh, controlled by S3 and S4 in addition to S2. And so if somebody has saddle anesthesia, not only are the areas where they would be sitting, those would be numb, but also there's going to be sexual dysfunction in terms of the sensory component. And that actually leads us to talking about bowel and bladder dysfunction and sexual dysfunction. We just mentioned how sexual dysfunction can involve the sensory component, but it can obviously also involve the motor component. You see here other things like the deep 
perineal nerve. We have a bunch of little muscles in here, the transverse perineal muscles, bulbospongiosis, ischiocavernosis, uh, in addition, the sphincters down here. Okay, These can also be impaired, and this can also impact sexual dysfunction, since the bulbospongiosis and ischiocavernosis in particular are actually important for a male erection and also female erection of the clitoris. So with cauda equina syndrome, particularly those affecting these lower nerve roots in the sacral region, um, you can have sexual dysfunction both in sensory and motor. And then also bowel and bladder dysfunction. We see here that the nerve to levator ani ultimately comes from S3 and S4. And so that's going to innervate puborectalis, pubococcygeus, iliococcygeus, and coccygeus, all four of which potentially can have issues. And these four muscles, particularly the first three, make up the pelvic floor. And so if pelvic floor is dysfunctional, that can lead to bladder dysfunction and incontinence. You see down here, we have the internal and external urethral sphincters. Only the external one is voluntary. However, they get their control ultimately uh, through S3 and S4 and a little bit of S2 as well. And so if you have uh, the cauda equina syndrome and these nerve roots are not working too good, then neither of these muscles. And so by this logic, you can end up with dysfunction in all three of these areas, bladder, bowel, and sexual. So if somebody comes into your clinic and they have this presentation and you're thinking they might have cauda equina syndrome, this is a situation where you need to get them in contact with their MD or even the emergency room pretty quickly because it requires an emergency surgical decompression. So decompression in the sense that whatever is compressing the cauda equina, in this case it's a posterior disc protrusion, they're going to decompress that and relieve that pressure on the cauda equina. Um, this is not necessarily life-threatening, but theoretically you'd like to be able to continue to use your legs, right? So in order to preserve the function of those nerves and your entire lower extremity and hip girdle function, there needs to be a surgical decompression. And the best results are going to be when this is done within 24 to 72 hours of symptom onset, so about one to three days. None of these things are intrinsically life-threatening, However, the longer you let this go, the more likely these are to be permanent, and if they become permanent, you drastically affect somebody's function and independence. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of cauda equina syndrome. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.